Welcome to the Crime Redefined podcast produced by Zero Cliff Media. Coming to you from the U.S. Bank Tower, high above downtown Los Angeles. In our podcast, we drill deep into forensics and criminal investigation from the viewpoint of the defense, as well as explore the intersection of the media and the justice system. I'm Dion Mitchell here with my socially distanced co-host, Mayhul Angeria. On this episode of Crime Redefined, we have a special treat for you. We're talking to MMA legend and Hollywood action film star, Kung Lee, about his new TV project, Flight or Fight, that just might save your life. Yeah, as a big MMA fan, I'm really looking forward to today's interview. Kung Lee is a former Strike Force middleweight champion who famously defeated Frank Shamrock for that belt. Kung has also fought in the UFC, and he's been in the ring with the likes of Michael Bisping, Vanderlei Silva, and Rich Franklin. Now, if you're not as familiar with MMA as Mayhul is, you may know Kung from this impressive list of movies he's been in. To name a few, Fighting with Channing Tatum, Pandorum with Dennis Quaid, Dragon Eyes with Jean-Claude Van Damme, and Puncture Wounds with Dolph Lundgren. Well, I think we've established, Dion, that Kung is a tough guy. And so now that we know his resume, it's pretty obvious that Kung's got the right stuff to bring us a TV show about survival. And let's face it, with all the craziness in the world right now, we really all could uh, you know, benefit from paying more attention to some basics like situational awareness, self-defense, and first aid. Like Kung says, you are your first responder. That's right. If not you, who? Nobody. Kung has a scissor reel out for his new and improved version of Flight or Fight, and the timing couldn't be better in this age of COVID, civil unrest, and increasing violent crime. Oh, don't forget the asteroid strike that's coming as well. (laughs) Why not? Let's just get it all in in 2020 so we can get out of it, right? (laughs) Sit back and relax and enjoy the hour-long chat we are privileged to have with Kung Lee on a number of topics. Kung. It's a great honor to have you on Crime Redefined today. Thanks for having me. um, I'm looking forward to this interview. See what you guys got for me. Yeah, you know, I've enjoyed watching you fight in Strike Force and UFC over the years, and we really do appreciate your time today. We'll make this uh, fun. So, uh, uh, Kung, let's just jump into it. uh, Let's just set the stage. And first of all, tell our listeners, what is flight or fight response and what happens to the human body when it occurs? Well, uh, fight or flight, basically you're in a situation that could be life or death, or if you're in a, um, like facing someone that is a threat, your body responds in certain things like your adrenaline kicks in, uh, and, and it all comes down to how you react to it, you know, and there, there's, there's, there's a moment when you, you might have to fight or you decide you take flight. So, um, my show, uh, I've done this show, uh, but I started this show about two years ago and I got an investor to fund one episode. I actually ended up shooting two episodes out of the, the funding, but one of my co-hosts who I paid for both shows ended up uh, thinking that he was bigger than the project itself and, and said that if I had to use, if I was going to use his likeness, um, then I would have to renegotiate with him for back end ownership. So I decided to scrap the, the scrap the project and, you know, put it in God's hand. And when it was the right time to reboot it again, you know, those things, those things happen, you know, there's a, there's always a giant ego out there somewhere under a rock. Well, uh, it, it, in a way it's um, my fault because, you know, when, when we were doing this show, he was only going to come on for one episode and, and uh, you know, we did a gentleman's handshake, and you know, now I learned the little you know, learn, right? I, I learned the hard way. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I easily could have won in court, you know, um, but you know, he he's a veteran, um, you know, he served our country, and you know, um, whether he decides to, you know, you know, be this way, and you know, I, I think, you know, you know, a part of it is, you know, you know, could be his wife too. I don't know. Whatever the case is, I just moved on. You know, I moved on and now I got an amazing team. The concept's way better. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm totally excited where we've shot the sizzle. We re-edited him completely out of it. And, you know, we're completely redoing the show. So I, I told the 
I told the person who invested in my show, uh, you know, that you know, I apologize, but I don't want to give him any credit out there. He doesn't deserve it. And, uh, you know, yeah, sure, he served our country, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to move on to, you know, someone who who's more, um, you know, um, uh, you know, of a man of faith. And, um, and I know that I put in God's hands, you know, uh, with God before me, nothing can stand against me. So here, here we go again, right in the pandemic, right when everyone needs it. And uh, it's time. So, yeah, it's great timing, Kung. And I just saw it online last week. And, you know, the reboot is is really kick ass. It looks really intriguing. So tell us about where you're at now. Who are your current cast members? And what's really the goal of the show? Well, um, you know, Chad, he's, uh, you know, I, I don't want to give everything away, but Chad, he's, uh, you know, 10 year veteran. Uh, also was an instructor for the, you know, SEAL teams and, uh, you know, anti-terrorism instructor and did a two 13 month tour as a, you know, diplomatic protection. And then, uh, you know, I got, a um, also someone who's going to talk about the PTSD and the effects that what, what, what a person will feel before the incident and how they can recover and, take steps to recover after an incident and um you know i i think you know it's like the the the, the three elements of you got your tactical guy you got your martial artist you know world you know i've been on you know fighting martial you know on different platforms different styles you know throughout my whole career i know what works in self-defense i know what works in combat and i know what doesn't work either you know so um, uh, and then, then we have our, you know, family therapist that can work with, you know, uh, like a man or a woman or even a child, because we're dealing in today's world, you know, look what's going on. Kids are going missing. You know, there's pedophilia going on. There's, you know, uh, you know, uh, obviously right now, um, <laughs> the COVID is, you know, outshining what's happening to our kids. So, you know, how, how do we protect our kids? How do we protect ourselves? You know, and wh when do we fight? When do we run? You know, and I, I believe that show, this show will kick ass. You know, think of ridiculousness where in the show it tells you what not to do. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and it shows funny stuff. And in our show, we show you the realness of the world we live in and, what you could do in these incidents with your skill level. Well, to that point, Kung, I am addicted to your flight or fight official TV IG account. And absolutely. One of the most disturbing things on there are the human trafficking scenes. And I understand that Instagram's actually shut your site down before. Why is that? I have no idea. You know, we actually pulled the, you know, pull the content off of, uh, you know, other sites. And then, you know, we, we make sure all of our content, you know, is, uh, you know, we, 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 when we post something, it's facts and there's facts behind it, you know, there's news covering it. So I, I don't know, you know, um, as you, as you hear, you know, uh, certain, certain people are controlling the media and when they want something to be out, they, they'll let it out when they want, you know, when they don't want something, they'll, they'll red flag you or they'll shut you down. We've been shut down, you know, different times, but with, with all the overwhelming support, you know, I think, uh, you know, and you know, God's will, we're, we're, we're always back on. So we're just very careful on what we're posting. Now we even have a backup account with 10,000 followers, you know, and, um, I, I, I feel blessed to, you know, be, be the, the, the guy behind this, uh, you know, the mastermind and putting it all together. And I feel really blessed with the great team now, you know, before I felt like, you know, it's uh, like a, a two man show and we were going to bring in victims, but now it's, it's, it's about bringing in different specialists because, you know, we can't just focus on one, one person's uh, you know, something that happened to one person, but we got to focus on what, everyone in the world can do if this happened and since there's footage out there you know we will take the footage we will break it down 
and then we'll give you all the different options from, you know, the hand-to-hand combative, you know, tactical side. And then there's the tactical element of, you know, you know, the gun dynamics and, and military mindset. And then, then when we bring in our, you know, special guests, we actually even have someone who uh, was uh, an expert home invader and looks for all the, the, the weak signs and, and what they would go after, you know, someone who would be an easy victim or if they want to, you know, turn up their, uh, you know, uh, adrenaline rush, then they go after someone who's tougher, you know? So we, we, we break down, there's three different kind of, um, predators out there. There's a predator that goes after the weak and only the weak they will go after. And, and then, then there's a, you know, the spontaneous where, Oh, you know, an opportunist and then, you know, the moment's right for them and they don't care who it is. And then they, you know, they become the predator and they go after the victim. And then they're, they're the last one, I believe is the most scariest one. Those are the predators that look for a trophy. They look for something hard. They look for, you know, someone to, you know, hurt or rape or kill or, you know, steal from. And those are the ones, you know, you put on top of the, you know, on the list of the, you know, the predators that are, they, they hunt for the trophy. They hunt for the thrill, you know, when they don't have to. Yeah, that's a great segue for my next question. In your sizzle reel and on Instagram, you mentioned a number of products that can help people with preparedness and self-defense, such as pepper spray. First of all, for our listeners, is pepper spray legal? Yes. Well, you know, in most states, it's legal, right? I don't know in other countries, but now as you're living in a pandemic, and if you can't carry a gun or haven't taken your CCW or don't like firearms, what are you going to do if you're a 120-pound female and, you know, you're, you're about to be attacked? You know, like what, what I say is, you know, don't, you know, um, don't be that victim. You know, at least give yourself a fighting chance, you know. Not only Absolutely. should you have that pepper spray i suggest get the the one that looks out like a fire extinguisher you can punch with that you know big ass you know uh, pepper spray and you can spray and it, it has distance you can walk around with it pull it out of your purse if you feel threatened and and then you know you don't even have to give warning as soon as someone steps into your to in, into your area of you know comfort area spray them and 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 if you have that mindset and you are in control of your emotion then you can say you're making me feel uncomfortable i have pepper spray um i will use it and if they continue then spray them get off the x and keep spraying them and run is there a particular brand that you liked and uh if, if so uh, where can you purchase it at well um evoke tactical they they carry uh saber it's a brand called saber right but i i've come up uh, I'm doing some, uh, you know, product development with uh, some other companies. It's a military grade pepper spray. You know, like for me, as you see, uh, that the Asian community has been, you know, affected really bad by, um, like everything. I'm not saying that, you know, well, you know, no one else is being affected. I'm saying we have been affected mostly our elders because, you know, you know, we we are easier victims because our elders, you know, are, you know, self-sufficient. They'll walk to the store by themselves. They'll go grocery right. shopping. They'll go to the bank and, um, and, and they're, they're just easy targets. They're just easy target. Cause they're rolling around with their purse. And as you see, there's 80% of the uh, things that I, I watch is because, you know, these elder, you know, el- elderly, you know, uh, grandmas or granddads that are out and about getting getting caught in the crossfires, you know. Well, let's talk about that. And so, let's say we're you know we do some advice for the you know elderly community for everybody. What are some of the products that people should own in a case of emergency like this? What we're going through with the pandemic. Well, first of all, like before I even stress product, right? I stress situational awareness, right? I stress about hey, if you're if you're gonna go out and about right now in this in this time and age, 
let's let's wait till someone gets home so you can go and you know travel in twos you know at least there's two people and and if someone's standing in front of you or you're getting you know your purse or you know you're getting mugged you've done everything else wrong already because you didn't check your situation awareness you didn't see you know check your surroundings and you didn't check for all the people that are in that area and you know or in the cars or being suspicious so that's that's one layer that you have to go through and two if they're in front of you and they are about to you know attempt something to rob you or to you know a, a hate crime you got pepper spray and of the pepper spray they somehow got through the pepper spray their eyes they are blinded or if you didn't douse them right make sure you have some kind of blade you know of course if you don't know how to use it you know then then that blade could you know end up in their hands so there's a lot of different elements but for me if if if, if i'm going out and if, I, if 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 it's my time i'm i want i prefer to go out fighting rather than going out on my knees well said uh kung take us back to your youth and if you would paint a picture for us what it was like to be a young vietnamese kid growing up in san jose and how that turns you into the warrior that you are today you know, when I was when I first came to America, I was, uh, you know, first we stopped in three diff- different refugee camps. First in the Philippines, then after that um, uh, in Guam, then in uh, down in the Monterey area. Then we got a sponsor. Uh, someone took us in in Monterey, and then uh, from there, uh, after uh, almost a year, we moved to San Jose, and you know, we uh, I'm that Asian you know, uh, family like fresh off the boat where you're loaded in a small house, four bedroom house with 13, you know, uh, people, you know, uh, where the, the first two rooms is dedicated to my, uh, grandparents, uh, who, who, who got the house. And then my great grandma had her own room. And then the aunts, the aunts got one room and the uncles got the others. And I was with the aunts because my mom, you know, I, you know, I was, uh, the first, uh, uh, the, the, the first um, kid, you know, in the batch. So, um, yeah, it was uh, it was crazy. It was, uh, you know, living with a bunch of, you know, uh, 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 ants in, in one room was uh, was was rough. How bad? So just growing up and, uh, you know, going through life being bullied and, you know, a lot of, you know, kids, whether they're American or or African or Mexican, they didn't understand why their uncle or their dads died in Vietnam. So they definitely had a lot of, um, you know, animosity and hate and resentment, you know, to the, to, to the boat people, to the Vietnamese people who came in trying to start over. And, you know, you know, we lost our, our country, you know, and, and we're starting over. So, and, you know, it was, it was, it was tough, but I, I believe, through toughness and through the, the struggles that I endured, it helped me become the person that I am, I, along with having faith in God and um, my mom teaching me right. You know, so I, I, I wasn't raised by my dad. My dad was, you know, uh, stuck in Vietnam and he came over when I was eight. But, you know, uh, uh, they were divorced by the time I was fre- uh, freshman. So it obviously didn't work out. And, um, you know, I, being, being from Vietnam as a refugee and going through what I've endured, I, I believe this is like the American dream, you know, when there's struggle and there's success. And, uh, you know, now we're in a time of pandemic. This is, you're living in your own movie. Kung, tell us a little bit about your entree into martial arts and the first time that you were able to shut one of these bullies down physically and what that felt like. Um, you know, I, when I first started martial arts was when my mom says, uh, that's enough. You know, I came home with a bloody nose and a black eye and she said, I'm going to take you to, to a dojo and, and, you know, we're going to find you a a teacher to teach you how to defend yourself. But, you know, going in, she, she still had to work two or three jobs. She wasn't getting me in consistently, you know, so, and when she told me, you know, you know, at first she told me, you know, don't fight. You know, it's, it's not good. It, you, you oh, oh, the one thing that you do when you fight is you, the only thing, one thing that you gain is one, one, one more enemy. And so I didn't fight. I just, you know, got bullied and picked on and beat up. And then like 
my my teacher told me, you know, um, you know, sometimes you have to defend yourself. So, uh, but he didn't really. I didn't really go through like consistency of classes. But what, uh, you know, so I continue to get bullied. Um, I, I, you know, just going through a couple weeks of martial arts doesn't mean that you can fight, right? So I'll still get my my butt my butt whooped. Right, and, right. Uh, not until I started joining wrestling and then got you know you know got into it you know after like after seventh grade I, I felt like I can carry my own you know I, I, even in seventh grade my first year into wrestling I um I, I went to the nationals I didn't I didn't place but I went you know and and uh, uh I you know come eighth grade before I went to um beca- before I became a freshman I remember uh, the last day of school, uh, some freshmen came in and, uh, you know, just because I, I did, I wasn't, you know, like, you know, you know, I, 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 I did something wrong to one of his cousins or whatever. I don't know whether I, I don't remember exactly, but I didn't start it. And, um, you know, he came in and he tried to, you know, he tried, he tried to pick a fight and, you know, next thing I know, I picked him up and double legs, slammed him down and the fight was over. <laughs> knocked, knocked, knocked the air out of him and that was it. And, and pretty much the whole school saw that. And it was like the last day of school. So from there, I, I went into it as a freshman in high school. Everything was cool. I just competed for the, you know, try to compete for the varsity spot, which I didn't get. But, you know, I, I had so much great experience and the, the, the wrestling journey began, you know, really began as a freshman, you know, um, even at as eighth grade, I actually placed at nationals at six, but you know, I, I wasn't like year round yet. I was still like, you know, like six months and then take a couple months off and then back into wrestling. But, you know, as a freshman, I was year round wrestling all the time. It really sounded like it uh, got a hold of you. And it's amazing how with that kind of uh, motivation, uh, what's, what's possible. I want to ask you about your sizzle reel where you show a lot of advanced tactical weapons, techniques, and martial martial arts moves, but what are some of the basic tips that we should all know about survival? Uh, The basic tips is stick to the basics. There's nothing fancy about anything and don't go to a class, a self-defense class for a weekend and believe that, now you can defend yourself. This is a uh, pretty much every day, if not five days a week, whether you're in the shower or whether you're at home taking a break from your work or for the kids out there, if you're taking a work from in between your home studies and your shadow boxing and you're doing your, your basic punches, your basic, you know, head butts, your, your basic angles, you're, you're working your 50% to your, zero percent meaning if someone stands in front of you you don't want to be in front of them that's being at their hundred percent you 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 will take on the hundred percent of their power if you take off the 50 you still got your hundred but they're only at their 50 percent so they're only really uh you know got one good side to attack you from before you guys square up again so that's you know just you know um those are the basics that i teach and you know your basic jab your cross your hook your knees, your low kicks, your stumps, and then uh, putting a blade in your hand. If whoever's done boxing, whoever's done kickboxing, uh, you know, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. You you put a knife in re- a reverse grip position and you're throwing combos with that. You can punch with the fist, then slice after, or you can hit with the blade only. And um, having a blade or two in your hands, I believe that that's the game changer. You're not doing any stabbing. You're not trying to be a knife fighter. You're not going through your you know, nine or 10 or 11 different slashes that you learn in a knife, you know, class, whether it's a saber knife position or whether it's a reverse grip, you know, you, you are doing what you normally do in a kickboxing class. You're throwing combinations at someone's face and you got a blade in your hand, you know, and, and if you're, if you're fighting, you've done everything wrong uh, about, you know, uh, again, I I always stress that to the people I, I teach. If, if you're fighting or you're confronted with someone, you, you, everything you've done with situational awareness and knowing your surroundings, you, you, you failed. So you're so, saying that you should, if your head's up and you're aware of your environment and in tune with what's going on and you can, you know, kind of see maybe a, a situation potentially coming up on you to remove yourself from that. So you've, you're, you've lost the battle already if you have found yourself kind of, you know, in that situation where you've got to fight is, is kind of what you're saying. 
Correct. Correct. You know, um, at honest level, you know, and if you feel like you're being followed, here are the three things you need to know. The time that you're being followed, the distance that you're being followed, and you make that change of direction, and that guy's still on your tail, you're being followed, get to a busy, crowded area, and um, basically, you know, work your elements, work your mirrors that when you walk in, and, and, and you know that if you're in this place, there's a lot of people, and there's cameras, and that's, that's your safer bet, and that's when you can pull out your cell phone, and if you don't have one, you can ask someone in there saying that you, you're, you're being followed and you need to borrow their phone. And, uh, you know, you, you know, you, you can, you know, hand them something so they don't think that you're going to run off with their phone. And then, then you make your call and you stay right there until someone gets there and then you can report it. But while you, while you, while during the time, during the distance, you should try to get the plates, you know, you try to get the make of the car. And if you're able to, you know, see the person in there then you should try to get a facial description you know right away make those notes that these are those are all great uh advice and tips and i hope people will listen to this several times so it it sinks in it's great and it actually sets up another great segue so if you don't mind i'd like to throw just a really simple scenario so how would you apply flight or fight technique to the average person. And here's the scenario. Let's say someone uh, using Kenosha or Seattle or Portland or any of these hotspots right now um, who has inadvertently found themselves the wrong place the wrong time. So let's say, for example, um, I, I, a car is too easy because that happens. But let's say you're just walking down a, a city oh. street. You don't know if anything's going on. You turn the corner and all of a sudden you're just you're, you're, you're in it. And then they've turned on you. Do you have any suggestions there? Any tips you can give us? Well, uh, you know, if you're walking and then you turn the corner and you're not seeing everything that's going on before it happens, you can't just turn a corner and all of a sudden you're right in the like midst of battle, right? The, the battle has people running, have people scared. So if you're not looking ahead and you don't, you're not seeing one or two people running or, you know, you know, yelling and, you know, gunshots, then again, you've done everything wrong and you happen to turn that corner and you see everything going on, what's the best thing to do is turn right around and, and turn, you know, turn on those, you know, turn on those uh, uh, rockets and, and, and sprint out of there, you know? Now that's, that's great. And you're actually, that's a, you, you know, you kind of uh, did a soft call out to me because you're right. If you're, if your head's not on your phone and you're walking down, you should be able to hear, or you say, you, you know, see people or, you know, walk going the other direction or commotion going that direction. So what you're saying is if your head is up and your eyes are forward and you're not buried in your phone, that scenario should, should never happen. You should have your head on a swivel, your ears open, and you should be seeing things coming your way. So there is not really a scenario where you turn a corner and you should be surprised. Is, am I understanding you correctly? Correct. Correct. You know, if, again, there's a lot of things, 99.9% .9 of the time, if you have your head on a swivel and you're paying attention to what's going on, you can avoid the whole situation. Don't even go there. Right. Drive all the way around, take a scenic route, whatever it takes, right, right. you know, and instead of, you know, if you walk into it, then, you know, in, in, unless you're, unless you're a sheepdog, you know, because sheepdogs, they, they, they tend to run towards gunfire and, you know, try to see what they can do. And, you know, there's, there's, there's always the, the smart ones and the wise one, right? Sometimes, you know, it's better to be smart and learn from the wise one and don't make the, the mistake that that wise person makes, you know, so you have to you know, assess the situation, analyze it, kind of figure out, you know, what, what the risk is. And if anyone's life is in danger, because I, for me, I'm that person, I, I won't turn a blind eye if I can help or save someone. <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, uh, whether it's a, a quick phone call to 911 or it's uh, uh, calling, you know, the, the, the police, and of course you are your first responder. So don't put yourself in that situation where you have to respond to yourself. Right. So if you're responding to someone else, uh, someone else, because they're, they're in a situation or they're bleeding out, then you, you are the second responder because they don't know what to do. You're always going to be, the police will always be the second responder or whoever comes there, you know, and sees you yeah, for the first advice. time. Either. Yeah. So it's, 
you need to know what you're doing. You need to tourniquet yourself unless you're not, excuse my Vietnamese, if, unless you're not the fuck out and someone <laughs> right. sees that, you see, check the pulse, see if the person's alive or breathing. And then, uh, you know, and if you have CPR, get to work. If not, call 911. Well, Kung, obviously as a martial artist, you experience flight or fight daily. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about a few situations that you've been in that I've heard you speak about previously. So first of all, in the Michael Bisbing UFC fight, when you had your orbital broken in the middle of the fight, but you decided to go on, how did you dig deep and find the strength to do that? And wh- how did that feel? What was going through your head? Um, when Michael hit me with that jab, that didn't really move my head. And um, the, the, the feeling that I felt was I had to throw up and uh, take shit at the same time. Oh, wow. That's kind of like, yeah. So it wasn't the or- orbital bone. It was the bone that held up your eyeball. So I was oh, okay. bleeding inside of my, my face. And, um, you know, it was just uh, the most awkward, painful situation that I was ever in because you know at one point you can actually just stop and say oh shit something happened to my eye but here you're like you got some you know um some uh you know uh, top level fighter trying to take your head off and he sees that you're squinting and because he damaged your eye so he's gonna go for the kill you know i i think at the time right there you know for me I, i'm in a fight it's uh you know <laughs> you can call it blood sport or you call it whatever you want it's, it's as real as it's going to get. That's the saying that UFC used to use. And, you know, I, I just didn't think of my, 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 my life or, you know, my well-being because I was in my fight or flight. I couldn't get out, you know, and I'm not that guy who, who's going to quit. So I'm going to go until, I, until they carry me out on the stretchers or, or, or the fight's over. And, um, you know, when you're in that situation, you, you kind of know who, what kind of person you are, what, what will you do if it really came down to a life or death situation? Maybe that was a life or death situation. So I was in it. So that was my experience and I know what I would do. So I wouldn't bail out on any of my family or my friends if we were in that, that situation. So, you know, after that, I realized, you know, um, I could have stopped the fight sooner, but, uh, you know, being hard headed and uh, wanting to finish the fight, you know, or get carried out or the referee stops it, then, uh, you know, that's the decision that I took. And, you know, I, I took the gamble and, you know, I, I uh, what I learned from it is I won't quit. You're going to have to kill me. Yeah, you've never tapped out, have you, Kung? No. Wow, that, that's incredible. And I also heard you recently mention that you were able to successfully defuse a potential road rage, road rage incident uh, with your family in the car. Could you kind of describe that a little bit and talk about the mindset you used to achieve such a favorable outcome in that tough situation? Yeah, um, I was driving. These guys came in and, you know, they, they took an illegal turn and I... Um, thank God I, I, I saw that. So I kind of swerved out and I swore back in, but I, you know, I didn't throw down my window and I flipped them off or anything. I kept my cool and I was more thankful, like that nothing happened to me. And, you know, it, like in my car, so they were in a Beamer, but right away I saw, you know, like they swerved out too, cause they almost hit me and, you know, it, it's my right away, you know? Um, um, so basically I, right away, I, 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 I saw them, I saw three guys in the car and they, they, and they were like, you know, the pressing hard to come, come to my, uh, to, to, you know, to my driver's side, uh, in their car and I was driving. So I kind of moved over and kind of, you know, kind of cut them off so they couldn't drive by me. Cause I, I didn't know what was going on. Right. So, um, so, uh, you know, I, so from that situation, they, 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 they literally like, pulled right beside me because I came to a stop site, uh, a stoplight and they, they were in a, like a, a turning lane now. And they, they just started saying, Hey, go back to China, go back to, you know, wow. Nip. I mean, started, you know, going off and, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, uh, you know, and, and nowadays in age, you know, 
you know, I, I might be an MMA fighter, but I, I'm not blue, you know, um, but I was prepared. I was prepared. Uh, my son was in the car. My, my wife was in the car. So, but you know, I, I, you know, I was ready to take action, but at the same time, I was looking on the right and I was looking on the left, even though it's red light, was I able to, you know, speed past that red light without, you know, getting hit by another car. I checked my situational awareness and I saw, you know, these guys were just running their mouths and, you know, I didn't see a threat. So, you know, I, I, I just kind of nodded and, and then, uh, kind of, you know, just defused it by, you know, yeah, that's, that's great advice because uh, I, I don't think that there's a driver in Southern California or Northern California that has not experienced that. I think every single driver on the road has, has, you know, has run into that situation. So that's some great advice. So hopefully everybody's paying attention and, and uh, we'll, we'll follow your advice. So let's talk about your film career on top of everything else we've discussed. You have an impressive film career as well. I understand that on your first film in 2007 in Toronto, you were thrown into the deep end and were acting with some big names like David Carradine. So full disclosure, I grew up on King Kung Fu. I'm a huge David Carradine fan, but I'd love to know what that was like. When, when I first came on, uh, they said I was actually uh, coaching the U.S. national team um, in, and uh, the event was in Hanoi, Vietnam. And I was the, the head coach, and I had six people in the in the semifinals, and um, I two just moved on to the finals, and then uh, you know um, I got a call, and it was my mom. She's like, "Hey, uh, you got to call this uh, Russian producer back. He wants to put you in a movie." And I'm like, "Mom, um, can you call me like later on? I'm right in the middle of coaching," and then um, and then she's all, "No, you have to call this guy right now." And I was like. Uh, uh, Mom, it's two o'clock in the morning, your time. What are you trying to, you know, uh, get some sleep, Mom? And then so I said, I promise I'll call him. So I did call him and he's all, I need you over here right now. I said, sorry, I got, uh, you know, uh, four going for the bronze medal, two in the finals. I cannot leave. And then he's all, can you leave tomorrow? I said, nope, that's uh, award ceremonies. I want to be there for my fighters that, you know, because they, they're getting their medals. And then, uh, then, then he goes, what about the day after? I said, I can travel the day after. So we, we made the agreement. I flew out there. And then as soon as I got on set, I was like, no breaks. They put on makeup and I did my first scene. And I thought I was just signing a $20,000 contract to be in the main fight. But when I got there and then I did, I, I shot my first scene in the weight room. And then uh, the, the, the producer says, hey, everyone, uh, come together. I want to introduce you our new star. And I was like, holy shit. What do you mean new star? What do you like, like, and, then, and they, so, so they said that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to take lead in the whole movie. And then, uh, you know, that, that's, you know, and then the lady who had the call sheet and then the scripts, like the, the dialogue for tomorrow, she's all, here you go. Here's uh, my first scene was with David Carradine. And so I was like, oh, thank, thank goodness that I've been taking uh, acting lessons. And, uh, you know, and, I, I, you know, from that day, I got like, acting lessons from Dave Carradine. I got it from Kara Tagawa. I mean, it was, it was pretty impressive. (laughs) I'm not many people can say that. Right. Yeah. yeah, Well, you know, I think Dave Carradine, you know, it was like the the next day when I showed up on set, he's all, Hey, uh, you know, uh, you're taking over Mark DeCosco's uh, spot. And so I don't know how your good, your acting skills are, uh, but uh, you know, make sure uh, just, just go with the flow. And uh, let's do it. Let's do a read right now. He's all, I don't do that. Um, go, go, go ahead. So I, I, I did the dialogue. He's all, you're so stiff, relax. Right. I'm like, well, you know, I've been, I've been watching you, you know, so I'm, I'm excited. And he's all, well, relax. And he kind of gave me his flask and I'm all, I don't drink, you know? And then he's all, okay, suit yourself. <laughs> and then, and then he's all, look, I don't want you to make, I don't want you to make me look bad. So I'm going to give you the, these tips. He's all, have you did a job interview? Have you done this? And I said, and I answered yes to everything. So, okay, you have a great memory bank. Now you're here looking for a job and convince me why I should give you this job, okay? I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm, and he's all, don't go off that dialogue. You're too stiff. I don't want you I don't want you to read from it and try to remember the lines. Just go in here. We can do it like an interview. I said, oh, okay, cool. 
that's kind of like my first lesson from David Carradine. I want to go back to your road rage story because we had a little bit of a drop in the connection. And I don't know that we got to your punchline. Can you kind of pick it up with what exactly you said to the guys in the car and how they responded? So when, when I pulled up to the stop sign, you know, because I actually cut these guys off so they, they wouldn't pull beside me, but there was a t- turning lane. I knew that they're going to come right up on me. And, you know, my windows was already down. Soon as I, soon as they pulled up, they were like swearing, cussing, saying, go back to China, you know, Chinese virus, the whole nine yards. And I, I just said, okay, I just nodded. And I just pulled up my hand, like I waved to them and they're like, what, you want some of this? And I said, no, I don't. I don't want, I don't want, I, I don't want no trouble. And then, uh, and then they, they, it, it was like everything that came out of their mouth was fuck you, fucking gook, fucking nip, Man. whatever it is. And I just kind of just nodded and, uh. I, you know, I glanced to the right, I glanced to the left and I made sure that the road was clear in case I had to make a quick exit. You know, I, you know, I, 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 I pair, I, I kind of like looked at my, you know, looked at these guys and, you know, I couldn't judge if they were like just all talk or, or anything, but I, I saw that they weren't in the best shape and they weren't, you know, that fit. So I figure, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be, wouldn't take much to, uh, you know, um, you know, if they got out of the car, I just have to, you know, swing my door around and make sure, you know, my kids and everything are, are safe or speed up, you know. So I just looked at my options, looked at my situational awareness, kind of looked at the distance from their car to my car, how fast, as soon as they open their door, I had to be ready to op- either open my door or, or take off, um, you know, drive through the red light. So I, I already had it all, you know, like, okay, plan one, plan two, plan three. And it's, it's just how quick you put it all together to, to, you know, maneuver and take action. So, you know, it's just a lot of, a lot of name calling. And then, you know, and I just tell them, I'm sorry, you feel that way. You know, um, you know, um, I'm Asian. Yes. uh, But I'm not Chinese and, uh, it's not the Chinese virus, you know, um, it's called COVID-19. So, you know, and, 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 and then they're like, Oh, you, you being a fucking smart mouth. Oh, not at all. I'm just trying to let you know what it is. It's not called the Chinese virus. It's COVID-19. So, you know, like that's, that's basically how, you know, like giving them that, but I never like raise my voice by me keeping the, the tone. I would talk like right now, uh, kind of diffuse the, you know, diffuse the whole situation because if I would raise my voice, then ego checks in. Right. So I, I know to check my ego at the door. I know what I can do to these guys. If I drop one of them on their heads, and then you'll know, kick the other guy in the face. Then I'm paying for a dental, uh, dental bill, and a, you know uh, a, lot, uh, a hospital bill because I think the guy in the back of the car he was quite young, and you know my my son would have came out and beat his ass, you know. So um, <laughs> so um, I, I think it was uh, uh, me uh, from that day on. You know, I I decided to get this insurance where if I pulled a gun out and I had to use a gun, or if I had to take someone out, or my dog took someone out or my son took someone out because of self-defense we're protected i got a two million dollar policy and you know and uh you know it's uh you know uh i i think it's probably one of my best investment uh 50 something dollars each month that i can spend you know spend my money on Hey, Kong, didn't you also tell those guys in the car something like, hey, if you get road rage, you're going to get a heart attack and it's not good for I your health? I actually did. I actually did. <laughs> I, um, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I actually yeah. said, hey, you know, um, you guys are really upset right now. Road rage, it's actually not healthy for you. And they're like, like <laughs> they were like, Great. they were confused, right? I said, you, that, that, you, that can get, give you high blood pressure. That can give you a heart attack. And they're just like tripping out. And then they... <laughs> As soon as the light turned, uh, you know, turned green for them, as they're turning away, I can still hear them. Fuck you. You know, it's, it's just like, and, 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 and actually my son says, Hey dad, um, you know, um, what would you have done? I said, what I just did, nothing, nothing at right. There's no, you know, no, you didn't have to see me come out and beat someone or them pull out a gun. And now we're, you know, we're, we're all dodging bullets, you know? So, um, you know, God is good, right? This is what should have happened. And, you know, God wants, God will help those who help themselves, right? So we were able to avoid uh, a conflict. We're avoid, 
able to avoid any injuries happening to us, especially any injuries happening to them because I'm a professional fighter. I still do it. I still train on a regular basis. You train. And, you know, some guys could have really got hurt. And we, we we would end up with the hospital bill. And Well, it, it doesn't it doesn't it seem like the biggest assholes are usually the guys who are not in good shape whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, I, I, I think, you know, these are the guys that prey on like the, the victim. So when they saw me, uh, you know, I was just in my car, um, uh, you know, so they didn't see like the, my whole body. Right. So, right. but like just me carrying myself, like, like when, when I told them, I don't want no trouble and stuff like that. I wasn't, nervous at all i was calm i was collective and uh, i think you know i i saw the driver he was kind of like you know like kind of like he assessed the like you know like kind of like you, you looking at your opponent try, checking them out seeing you know you know where you know where the where the weak spots are right and i i saw the drivers like he was definitely scoping the whole situation out you know so in a way maybe these guys are you know, they, they like to find trouble and they, they, they look for the, the weak, the, like the weak victim because I done, I did nothing wrong. I just, you know, like when I glance over the right, I, you know, they almost hit me. So I just swerved out and I swerved back in. They say, I know they're like pulling, trying to pull right beside me. So I just cut them off, you know, trying to you know pull up to me. You know, I don't know what they're going to do. You know, I don't know if they can pull out a gun. So I just played it safe and I did that. They, if, if they, if they would have pulled to my, my uh, passenger side, I would have, I would have took that left, you know? So mm -hmm. I want to go back real quick. I, I wanted to ask you something about your film career. Can you take us through some of the struggles you've had with, of course, being asked to portray Asian stereotypes, like a triad member in movies and where you think the industry is today in that regard? Well, I think um, the industry for me, um, I'm a big, I'm a physical Asian. Uh, I can speak English. So, uh, you know, I can act. So I think I was getting a lot of those roles um, as the villain. And I actually got two roles as the hero uh, in Dragon Eyes and in Puncture Wounds, which was should have been called A Certain Justice. But, you know, they decided to change the name and, you know, for whatever reason it is. But, and then, uh, you know, like in Pandorum, you know, it was like, you didn't know if I was a good guy or a bad guy, but in the end I saved the whole, like, you know, mankind, uh, you know, um, during, during the end, end scene. So I felt like, you know, two years ago, I got the best, um, I got, I also got the most vote as the best villain. Um, so I, I didn't want to continue to be that villain guy, you know? So I just figure what I need to do, um, you know, so I just started learning how to write um, my own scripts and look for my own funding and, you know, figure it out. Unless it's a really good part, I'll take it. If not, then then I won't, you know. I, I just figure, you know, I just didn't want to play the bad guy and, you know, the, the gangster anymore. And, you know, it's uh, – I'd rather do something that's, you know, worthwhile, you know, with, with uh, you know, where the audience can really enjoy and get a good message out of it if I'm going to produce and – get financing for my own film, you know? So, um, and that's what I decided. So, you know, it's been two years since I, you know, since I got, you know, um, you know, got on, you know, got on the set because, you know, I'm, I'm turning parts down because I, I don't want to be the villain. Yeah. I thought that was a really positive take that uh, you're controlling your own destiny and developing your own, uh, content. I thought I was reading some other stuff about, you had comments about that, the portrayal of Asians in film and TV. And I just thought your take on it was really positive. And there was a lot to take away from that on for, for other Asian actors. I thought it was really great advice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you saw that. You know, I think a lot of people, you know, they, they have their own mixed views on it, you know, and, and uh, you know, now that you saw, you know, crazy rich Asians where the movie did great in the box office and there was a huge interest for from the Asian just side. Just takes that one, right? Just yeah, that just one. takes that one. And you know, I think now, um, you know, I'm doing, I, I'm writing scripts, uh, you know, that will, you know, kind of, kind of, what's the right word? Kind of marinate with the pop culture of today, what people are into, you know, uh, kind of talk about like, you know, like end day stuff, you know, um, give a good message, you know. I got this 
great um, assassin script that I, I, I put together. And it's kind of like, um, like uh, an Asian John Wick meets 28 days later. And it's basically like talks about the dead will rise and, and, you know, the choices that this assassin makes um, is like, you know, he's, he's all he knows is, you know, to, you know, to kill people. And the reason why he was trained to do this is because he thought that whoever he's killing was the ones that killed his family. So, Soul. Uh, well, long, line up ready. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're so uh, long story short, you know, his sister, who also works on the same team with him, gets killed and leaves leaves uh leaves her son behind. So I my character has a choice to continue to do what he does or quit and take him and you know get off the grid and train him in the mountains and train him how to survive. And and um and basically uh during this whole time, you know, like you know, we, we saw the, what drugs do. It turns people into these crazy 28 days later, you know, creatures uh, or humans that, you know, go crazy. And then, uh, and then we eliminated that. We, you know, got the, 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 the formula back off, you know, off this uh, guy who betrayed the guy who was raising us. And then, uh, uh, then, then, you know, uh, my sister finds out that, you know, the guy who was raising us, was the guy who killed our, you know, our, our real parents. And so, you know, now all, all barrels are pointed at us and, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's that choice of an anti-hero who, who was the villain in the movie who's killing people. He makes a choice whether he gets saved and, you know, and say, saved from, you know, um, his sins or not, you know, so is he going to continue to sin because he knows that he's kind of like doomed or is he going to do the right thing and, you know, take care of the, you know, um, his nephew and, and do the right thing. And so that's what he, his, his choice is to do. And then there's all kinds of twists and turns with, you know, well, I'm going like, to cut you off because I don't want to give you, have you give away too much. No, don't worry. <laughs> there's, there's a lot more to it. That's just the surface of it, you know? So yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, I'm, I'm in. I, hey, I want to ask you real quick about, uh, your website and that I noticed that you're offering, uh, online, uh, fight and fitness training, in, in this era of COVID production. I, I, first of all, it's a great idea. And I wanted to know uh, how that how that works and how's, how it's been going. I got really busy, so I pulled it off. But I started putting a whole bunch of stuff on my uh, YouTube page. And now I'm going to do it on my Facebook. I'm just going to give away basic self-defense and, and basic tips on you know, fight or flight situations for people to, you know, kind of understand if the people who are like, say that they don't have time to do it, well, maybe one lesson might, give them a, like a spark spark their interest to learn more because it's free online you know yeah, so it's something that i can give back and you know maybe uh, save someone you know down the line and you know and hopefully hopefully people realize how serious this uh, uh you know these times are right now right you know, I want to ask you, do you currently, obviously, I think everybody's kind of shut down, but do you currently have a, uh, a physical training center? And, it, and if you do, where is that? Like if, when, if once this, we get past this, this pandemic here, um, you'll, you know, take people on and, and train them in person. Well, you know, everything's closed right now, but I do have a uh, key to um, the gym that I merge with is smash gyms, San Jose, but you know, I'm uh, uh, there's a lot of people that, you know, invite me to their gym. I can train there anytime I want, but, you know, I train at, at smash gyms or I train at Barry, a tactical. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm doing some privates here and there with like more like firearms training. Cause I, I did get my, um, my, uh, NRA, um, you know, uh, you know, cert to, to train people in firearms. So, um, you know, uh, I'm helping. I'm helping out Bay area tactical with that. And, uh, you know, they were overwhelmed with so much business. So I figure, you know, it, I, I learned more when I taught in martial arts than when I, when I, then, then I turn around and I'm able to apply it better. Right. But now that I'm, you know, teaching firearms, I'm, I'm learning so much about gun safety, you know, how to manipulate the gun. And just by teaching it, it's, it's helped me become a better, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, better at that, you know, the, the, the gun fool art of it, you know? Well, Kong, for my last question, I want to shift gears a little bit. 
in my line of work, which is forensic science, specifically DNA analysis, there's a lot of problems in the industry with shoddy scientific practices and techniques. And these are in cases where there's high stakes. You know, people could be facing the death penalty. They could have life in jail. And what I thought was a good parallel was your experience with the HGH blood test. So if you don't mind, could you tell us a little bit about how you were kind of screwed over and what the problems were with that testing? Yes, I can totally uh, tell you about that. So basically, uh, before that even happened, right, um, I I was two weeks out from the Michael Bisping fight, and I was going to spend my last two weeks in, 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 in Vietnam to kind of acclimate to the, to the time change. And then, uh, you know, and also Saigon sports clubs always sponsored me. So they had me come out and do all my media and my press at the, at their 80,000 square foot gym. And, um, so, um, the lawyer from UFC uh, called me and says, Hey, did you, you know, uh, you know, we, we need you to sign a, uh, you know, a, another 18 month contract, six fight deal. And, uh, you know, I, I, I looked it over, but my lawyer didn't get a chance to look it over and he was on, he, he was on vacation. So I, I was going to risk, risk, you know, um, you know, signing it. So I, I, I told him my, my, my lawyer's out and I'll sign it. I'll, I'll have them look at it before I sign it. And they wanted to me to sign it that day. Cause I was leaving the next day to, to, to Vietnam and I didn't sign it. And, you know, during, during the, you know, um, uh, during the fight, as you know, with uh, any anabolic or drug test, uh, when when you do it, you have to be fasted. Your your resting heart rate's got to be, you know, when you wake up, you can't be exercised, especially not after a fight and you're bleeding. Your HGH levels will be at the max, uh, you know, output. And and so after they said I was my my HGH level was elevated, um, uh, you know, I was. I, I, I redid my blood test. I asked him to, you know, give me a retest that blood. And, you know, I wanted to see what about, you know, my opponent's blood. Where's that at? And somehow, you know, magically it got destroyed. So I was, you know, confused by that. And luckily, uh, Dr. Caitlin got on social media and says, hey, you're messing with my 10-year research. You know, Kung Lee, actually his levels are normal because... Uh, he didn't try to protect me because like we knew each other, he is protecting his 10 year research. So from the 10 year research, when, if you're going to test for someone with H, elevated HH levels, you got to test them fasted and you have to test them when they just woke up from, you know, their, their resting heart rates got to be at rest. And, uh, you know, when, when they did that, I was 15 minutes right after I fought and I was, you know, as you saw my face, I was kind of banged up, but, you know, um, so I wanted to see my opponent's blood work too, but it was, it was, it was destroyed as. Yeah. And on top of that, uh, the lab that they used to do the testing, weren't they like not accredited or, or not really set up to do that type of testing? Yes. Um, they, they basically use, uh, not, a you know, um, uh, what were those labs called, uh, the, the official lab that is, uh, you know, um, for, for performance enhancing drug testing. It was just a regular lab that they, that they use for like, you know, like if you, if you own a big company and you had to get your, you know, employees checked out, that's what they, they, they used, you know? So. So Kung, besides launching flight or fight soon, what other media projects are you currently working on? I understand that you are now the Shadowcast Chief Content Officer. What does that involve? Yeah, I'm. You know that he's got to get his um, his uh, his software to you know uh, kind of catch up to the speed of like you know his what he wants to achieve before I can start you know developing like storylines for him. You know, so. Um, um, you know, uh, there, and then I'm just writing my own script and then uh, get my own projects funded uh, through, you know, through um, through investors. That's that's what I got going on right now. And I'm working with the Barrier Tactical whenever, um, you know, because with this COVID, it's hard to get group classes going. So you either, you know, do, uh, you know, small classes 
which, you know, I, I feel like, you know, it's a little bit difficult because, because, you know, it's uh, with the small class, you can't, you know, paid like, you know, all your instructors. So everyone's rotating, you know, so. Well, Kung, I know we took up too much of your time, but thank you so much for joining us today and just for being an all around inspiration. Thank you for having me. And, um, you know, I appreciate it. And maybe the next time I get on, we can, uh, we can chat about my, uh, my wife's case because it, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can answer for me. And I think that would be a big one because, you know, this is the, this is the corruption side of fight or flight. Man, we really got a lot of survival tips from Kung that I thought will help all of us to be better prepared for almost anything. You don't have to be an MMA beast or tactical weapons expert to walk away from dangerous situations unscathed. But if you are, of course, that helps. Yeah, it really does. Kung's Flight or Fight show is, I think, really going to be a great public service. And I found it interesting that how it's not all about physical actions. Sometimes it's just how you present yourself or how you use your voice or even just having a calm and prepared mindset. And one of the tips that Kong gives in a sizzle reel has to do with pepper spray. And I think, you know, we typically think of pepper spray as something that you use when you're in close quarters with somebody, if you're being attacked, but it could prevent an attack as well. So like Kong said in the sizzle reel, let's say, God forbid, you're involved in a home invasion, you're upstairs in the bedroom, you hear them downstairs. Well, go out your bedroom door, flood the zone with pepper spray, which will either block them from getting to you, slow them down, or when they do get to you, they're going to have red eyes. And again, it just buys you enough time to call 911, to lock yourself in somewhere, to get a weapon, whatever. But it's just about getting that couple of seconds or whatever can make a difference. Yeah, I just thought it was a really smart, easy to apply tip. You know, I was really also excited, Mehul, to listen to Kung talk, take us behind the scenes of his MMA and film career. Yeah. I thought that was a very cool anecdote about him getting acting tips from David Carradine on set. For sure. I always thought he, I also thought he gave us a scoop, a TMZ scoop there about, uh, here's a few tips and a flask. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, that, that proves that Kung takes care of his body, you know, <laughs> turn it down the flask as if we know, didn't know that. You know what he did decline, just, you know, so you could hear it inside, you know, you know, his interview you hear, you heard him did decline it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I thought it was just gracious of Kung to spend so much time with us today. Uh, and I think it was cool that we got to go deep on a, a number of topics. So, uh, you know, we will definitely take Kung up on his offer for a follow-up episode. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can catch the sizzle reel for Flight or Fight at Kung's YouTube page, and we've also posted a link with the description of this episode. Also check out Kung's IG accounts at KungLee185 and at Flight or Fight Official TV. For all things Kung Lee, check out his official website at KungLeeOfficial.com. You know, we really hope our listeners are staying safe and healthy, and we truly appreciate all the downloads, follows, and feedback. Please check out all of our episodes at crimeydefined.com, and feel free to hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Thank you for listening to the Crime Redefined podcast. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Crime Redefined. Please send us your comments and questions and join us for the next episode.